Uh, but if given a priori knowledge about these uh, individuals, if I had some kind of theory here, I might say, well, all right, uh, we've got uh, uh, Joylo, right? Uh, from the uh, medical kind of environment, uh, John Carr from uh, communication, number two, number three, Mike Knight. Uh, now I might start as I was just going down this and noticing here that these were relatively little numbers and all of a sudden here's a big one uh, and here's another big one and they're in opposite directions. One of them is a plus something and the other one is a minus something. And so even though uh, that observation in and of itself might capture your attention, uh, the data have a way of interacting with the, the observer, the factor analyst at this stage so that even if you have a prior kind of theory uh, or a hypothesis that led you into this study, which you thought that this group would be in one factor and some other group would be in another factor, the data start educating you or at least having an impact. And it was at this stage, incidentally, that, that uh, Stevenson most often mentioned someone like Cantor in the interbehavioral character of the scientific enterprise, that, that you have these two things, the, uh, the stimulus domain and then the observer domain, both of which have particular kinds of histories, and they come together in an interbehavioral field. And Stevenson wanted to, the investigator in the, in the guise of a factor analyst to have the, uh, the opportunity at that point to take into account the theoretical knowledge that the observer had, the purpose of the experiment, all of these kinds of things that the computer could never know. The computer just looks for a least square solution, and it doesn't know anything about the respondents, the characteristics, uh, anything about the logic of the experiment or anything like that. And according to Cantor's specificity principle, there were some very specific things associated with each experimental setting. No two experimental settings were identical to one another, even in physics uh, and biology and chemistry and so forth. And therefore, you wanted to stick to the, spe the specifics. And the factor analyst, therefore, would have the opportunity to take in any of those kind of cues and hunches and, and influences that, that came about during the course of the uh, analysis to be able to include those into the rotation. So at any rate, we might uh, all of a sudden take note of this and say, gee, I wonder what's going on between those uh, respondents. Um, now, in this case, I may say, well, it's obvious that we've got at least these two big factors, although here's uh, somebody out here who has uh, a substantial amount of, of, um, of uh, factor saturation out here in this third factor. But for the moment, these first two look like they have quite a bit of the variability. Maybe I just want to look at those two. <clears throat> I would then at this point select two factors, and I might select factor one and factor two that I just want to look at. And it asks whether I want to put up all the variables one through six in this case, or just want to look at some subset. So I could say just, I just want to look at variables three and four or something like that. Usually I say I want to look at all of them, in which case we put in an asterisk, and it says do you want to just uh, have a, the, the symbol to represent these respondents just to be an asterisk, or do you want to use the respondent numbers, and I want to use the respondent numbers in this case. Now these, the location of these individuals as pictured here, uh, is simply a graphical representation of the factor loadings in the same kind of way that a histogram is simply a graphical representation of a frequency table. Uh, that is to say, uh, this person, number four, was probably up here like 0.5 on factor one and maybe 0.2 on factor two. And that person was like 0.55, number six was, and maybe a minus 0.30 or something of that nature. So that their location in factor space is a merely a, a manifestation of the magnitude of those factor loadings. Only what you see now in graphical terms uh, that you might not be able to visualize just looking at the table is um, that people who share similar space uh, have ranked the statements in similar kinds of ways. So the number four, number six, have ranked the statements similarly to one another, uh, whereas number two is not out here with anyone in particular. Uh, number one and three and five may be out on a third factor someplace. So we can only look at two factors at a time. Uh, so that now we may start getting a better 
feel for who goes with whom in this case and what the natural groupings may be. And again, we may be looking for something specific. Depends on the character of the study. If I'm wanting to say, um, you know, what is uh, public perceptions of uh, Bill Clinton, for example, and all of these Q-sorts have been Q-sort representations of what's Bill Clinton like. Uh, and if Q-sort number three, I happen to have gotten Bill Clinton to describe himself, then all of a sudden number three would take on a theoretical importance that, of course, the, Q the computer could never know what is interesting about three. It would just maybe try to rotate in such a way as to maximize the loading of some Q-sorts on some factors and other Q-sorts on other factors. But I might want to definitely uh, move the reference vectors in such a way as to maximize this person knowing that this is the target of perception. And these other people uh, may be in simple structure in some other kind of way, but what I want to know is how does their perception line up relative to the person's perception of himself in that case. Well, let's say that I was interested in, for whatever reason, just to make a long story short, that I was interested in number six, since that person over there, that's Peter Schmoll. Uh, and let's say that, um, for whatever reason, I was wanting to, uh, I took a special interest in that Q sort number six, and therefore wanted to maximize that Q sort on a single factor, to bring, bring it into focus with regard to that person. Now, I might guess that in order to get that person number six on a single factor, I would have to rotate let's say 25 degrees counterclockwise to bring this reference vector over here. When I do that, this reference vector is also going to go up. So what I'm going to succeed in doing if I rotate about 25 or 30 degrees counterclockwise is that factor one will now be defined by Q sort number six, and the second factor will, will have this Q sort on it, number two. And all you do in this case is to put in minus 30, <coughs> and uh, it is slightly, well, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. Here's number six way up here. One of the aberrant features of uh, the centroid method, in incidentally, is sometimes it can get factor loading in excess of 1.0, uh, particularly with small numbers of cases that can be uh, pretty much uh, ignored. But you see we have number two on this, number six on that one with four, who is uh, Eleanor Algo. So presumably, this represents some kind of preference set as far as interest in coming to the conference, factor one. Factor two, that uh, has um, uh, John Carr, another one, and that uh, Eleanor Allgood in this case would have been drawn by both of these kinds of considerations. Uh, well, we want to... Pardon? Well, you define the term orthogonal in relation to what you see on the board. Uh, orthogonal simply means graphically that these are 90 degree angles that we're, we're talking about uh, two uh, attitudes that are independent of one another. That is, that Q-sort should correlate about zero with this Q-sort over here. And once we get this factor out, which will represent a combination of Q-sorts, that combination of Q-sorts will correlate about zero uh, with these. Now, I might bring up in this context that sometimes there are philosophical questions raised um, um, I found for some reason more among sociologists than, than others uh, that well the world uh, doesn't present itself in terms of orthogonal factors. You really ought to be using oblique solutions, allowing the factors, not forcing them to be at 90 degree angles, but allowing them to to take more oblique kinds of angles. I know uh, Norman Van Tuberman's Q analysis, quantal program. The default is an oblique solution. And his justification is, is that factors, that attitudes in the real world aren't in oblique solutions. <coughs> I did never hear, well, I did hear Stevenson say something about that. You don't want to get complicated before it becomes absolutely necessary to get complicated. <laughs> and it's simpler to think of these as separate groups. I think another one, which I would hope that he would agree with, uh, would be that orthogonality is a function of mathematics and statistics, not a function of attitudes. Uh, and that uh, uh, when we see attitudes out there, uh, we see that these people have one kind of attitude and others have one kind of, another kind of attitude. Uh, the orthogonality or not is a statistical manifestation of the fact that they have these kinds of 
views. It's not something that's inherent in the phenomenon itself. So I have seen some studies, for example, of, of abortion, uh, in which sometimes you get <coughs> bipolar factors with the right to life people at one end and, and the uh, right to choice factors, uh, the respondents at the other end. I have sometimes seen studies of abortion in which the factors were orthogonal to one another. The question might be raised, well, which is it? Are, factor, are these uh, attitudes uh, bipolar or are they orthogonal? I think the answer probably is what was at issue was the way in which these particular investigators approached that kind of study. The kinds of questions that they asked were such that the response ended up orthogonal. Uh, others ask a different kind of set of questions so that you've got bipolar factors. And it's not that either one of them uh, defines how the reality really is in some kind of opposite, uh, some kind of inherent way. Uh, it depends on how you approach the problem. You recall I said every statement in the Q sample could have been the basis for an entire study so that you could take one of the statements from a study on abortion and do another study. And you might get bipolar factors in one study, do another study on some aspect of abortion, and get orthogonal factors. Both of them are part of the totality of the, of the public consideration about the abortion issue. So I think he would probably say that whether factors are orthogonal or not, that these are mathematical, these are mathematical consequences. Um, and ought not to be confused with the phenomenon itself. So that the idea that uh, attitudes are not orthogonal, they're probably oblique, I think is, is uh, taking the mathematical structure too seriously, too concretely, uh, and not distinguishing that from the substance of what it is that's being studied and being represented mathematically. Uh, okay. Um, after this, we next go to back to the factor matrix, and I don't recall what it was bef before, but these numbers have now all been changed. And they have been changed because we uh, rotated with an eye to maximizing number two, in this case. And who is the other one? Six. Six. Number six. Who is now here almost 1.0 on the uh, second factor. So we now have them effectively uh, on separate factors. And when we look over this, we might say, well, okay, now number two is accounted for. Uh, number three is accounted for. That is, they have uh, reasonably high factor loadings. Uh, number four is accounted for. That person is on one or the other or both. And here, this person, number two, would be an example of a pure case. Number three would be a pure case in that their significant factor loading is only associated with one factor and not the other, whereas number four would be a mixed case, a little bit of factor one, a little bit of factor two. Um, number six would also be pure. Number five <coughs> would be uh, null for these first two factors, not on either factor, and number one would be likewise null. So we might be satisfied with the first two factors now that they account for some people who have ranked the statements in a, a similar way. But we might then want to say, well, is there a third factor? Because person number one is not strongly associated with factor one or two. So is there a factor three someplace that that person fits on? And is that person on the same factor with number five? Which it looks like they're not going to be in this case. Uh, so we might next go out and see if we can build up, in effect, another factor. So we might take, we, when we eyeball it here, we, we can see right away we're not going to be able to rotate in such a way for number one and number five to be on the same factor. Uh, that's just not going to be in the cards. But we might say, well, let's uh, uh, try to build up a factor for a respondent number one anyway. We have some variability associated with respondent number one on the third factor, a little bit of variability on factor four as well. A little piece of that person's point of view is out here. So we can bring all of this variability from factor four and even from factor five all together on a single factor by rotating factor three against factor four. And when we do that, we would say, OK, well, let's take factor three and factor four. Uh, do you uh, want to use uh, <coughs> all of the variables, yes, uh, and use their numbers? So we're looking for respondent number one who had some loading on factor three was negative, 
and also some loading on factor 4. So if we wanted to define factor 3, let's say, by this person, we would have to rotate uh, 90 and then probably another 50 degrees, 140 degrees clockwise to bring that third vector right down through there. So if we went 150 degrees clockwise, that would give us uh, very close. We might want to go another 10 degrees clockwise, another 10 degrees to see what that does. And that puts us pretty much on that respondent. So if we accept that, we now see that respondent number one has gone from what was it, 0.49 before, or minus 0.49, to 0.53, and there's nothing left here, minus 0.02. Um, if we wanted to pick up this variability that's out here, we would want to plot factor three against <coughs> factor five. So we would say factor three and factor five, uh, star and um, two, uh, now we would want to rotate, let's say, 15 degrees clockwise, and that'll just about do it. Now this person is up to 0.55, and there's no variance that's left over on all of these other factors. Well, we might at this point want to adjust factors 1 and 3 to see if, if uh, <coughs> because sometimes a slight adjustment between two factors can, can improve both of them. Can I interrupt yes. you for a second? Would you look at subject 3? who has now risen incredibly to uh, 0 0.61. Uh -huh. The second highest uh, loading next to uh, number six, subject six in uh, factor mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And uh, this person uh, is just hanging out there. Yep. Okay, yep. Let's so would you, that. would you, yeah, would you? Sure, sure, sure. Um, let, let me see what uh, factor one and the factor three might look like uh, when we plot them together right now to see if any further rotation might help these. Uh, looks like um, now that we have respondent one. No, that's, I mean, we might adjust slightly so that this factor would go up to the center of gravity between number six and number four. But that looks like it probably wouldn't really be worth it. We might, you know, go up by maybe five degrees or something like that. Um, but that's not going to uh, help very much. All right. Well, Okay, what we have at this point, subject number one has got good definition on this factor. Subject number two has good definition on this factor, ignoring these out here for the moment. Subject number three has good enough definition negatively on this factor. Subject number four is mixed. Subject number five is undefined. And subject number six is mixed. So factor one is well, sufficiently well-defined. Factor two is sufficiently well-defined factor three, although it only has one person on it. Now, here it would be where you would have um, to make some sort of decision, and it would probably depend on the, on the character of this particular respondent, number three. There's something of that person's point of view that is captured by factor one in a negative direction. Whatever it is that Peter Schmolk here is interested in, that he's given plus two to, uh, this person has tended to give a minus two. Uh, so that you have a kind of inversion of those things. Peter Schmolk is interested in these things over here. This other person is not. That, this other person, number six, who, who, was, uh, who was that? Uh, no, that's number six, Peter Schmolk. Uh, number, uh, um, number three was uh, Mike Knight. Mike Knight. Uh, so that there, there would be some kind of inversion in the points of view that they, that they represented. Now, here is another aspect of this person's point of view that is not captured by this factor, but is out on another factor. Um, and so whether we wanted to include <coughs> that and look at that aspect, uh, you're under no necessary obligation to explain 100% of the variance associated with any particular person. Uh, you may want to just stick with these factors because these are common factors, whereas this is something that, that may be idiosyncratic or it may be that there are other people of a factor five type who exist in the world or in this room, but just didn't happen to be included in those that were put in the <coughs> analysis. Uh, so this would be the point at which some kind of judgment uh, would be made. Or it may be that you would want, for some reason, to rotate factor one against factor five and bring, the fa bring those two factors into focus on that person, in which case the others would become mixed. If this person 
uh, number uh, three is mixed on these two factors. If you bring the factor reference vectors uh, around in such a way as to put all of this person's variability on a single factor, then the other people who are pure on this factor now would become mixed, partly factor one and partly factor five. So it would be a choice. Is this the case when, for example, if you have a factor that has very few people loading, like, for example, if you study the nurses and the nursing home and the physician, you know, who's loading that to you would actually want to look into that factor? Yes, that, 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 that's a good example. There's one uh, study in uh, political subjectivity about a hospital ward team and who's going to make the decisions uh, on, on how to treat patients. So there's one factor that has all the psychologists and social workers on it, there's another one that has nurses on it, and there's one factor that has the MD. But it so happens that that person was in charge of the ward team, had all the authority, didn't matter what anybody else thought. Uh, so there, one person, uh, you might very much want a factor with that one person on it. In fact, that person may have been the basis for the original rotation to make sure that you've got the chief decision maker on a factor so you can see how everyone else lines up with regard to that factor. The point being, of course, that, that there's judgment that is involved. There's a particular theory, there's a particular understanding of the way society operates, whether it's the political society or it's the society that exists on a, in a ward team in a hospital, or the way people who come to a few conference, if I knew more about you individually, uh, that might influence the factor analyst's uh, way of thinking about the data thereby leading that person to take more things into account than the computer's ever going to be able to take into account. The computer just can't possibly know those things. It just knows the statistical relationship amongst those data points and tries to rotate in such a way as to maximize. Now, it may produce a structure that's perfectly all right for the factor analyst, but it could produce a structure that from a substantive or theoretical standpoint uh, was determined to be just the wrong way to look at it. Again, a simple Thing. You know, like if you've got Bill Clinton, then you know how he conceives of himself. You know, you may want that on a single factor. Uh, so you take into account, and the factors that you get may not have nice statistical properties, like Veramax probably will. But Veramax may have very bad substantive or theoretical properties that the Q solution does have. Now, again, that's very difficult to transmit to journal editors um, who want something that is independent of the analyst's will. And that can be dealt with to a greater or lesser extent also. If you are doing a general study in which your, your purpose is to try to explore and explain the dimensionality, dimensionality of the subject, do, do I infer from what you're saying that maybe the Veramax might be a good place to start? Yeah, that's because you don't have specific correspondence that distinguish them one from the yeah. other. Uh, I've done many studies in which I at least convinced myself that I didn't know what to expect at all, and therefore I had no reason for favoring this respondent over that respondent, uh, and would just let Veramax do it. And I oftentimes have run through SPSS for that purpose, because when you go that route, SPSS does a better job. Than Q method does as far as extracting the maximum amount of variance and rotating the simple structure does, does a better job. And the factor scores that it gets are, are statistically independent of each factor, statistically independent and so forth. I think Stevenson would say, and I, my hunch is that he was probably right, that, that there never was a problem for which the observer didn't have some kind of idea about something. In there. And I think the, the whole idea about abduction uh, you know, there's that there's nice little uh, story of Hearst getting off a ship uh, after going to a conference and discovering that his watch was missing. And he had all of the workers on the ship line up uh, and uh, went down, and for some reason, he said, that he couldn't explain. He said, this guy did. And the ship's captain said, why do you think that? He said, I don't know. I just think he did. Uh, and the ship's... Uh, captain couldn't do anything about it, such flimsy evidence, so Purse hired a Pinkerton agent to follow this guy, and they finally, finally got the watch. I mean, Purse was right. And Purse's reason for, for telling that story was to show that he was very much influenced by Darwin, that the mind is the way it is because of evolution, 
therefore, in, in, in our efforts to forage and to survive in the world, we, the mind has developed the capacity to make discriminations amongst stimuli for, for reasons that we may not be able to explicate or, to, or may not even be aware of. Uh, but are there as hunches and guesses and feelings and so forth that people have. And that whereas there's no guarantee that that's the right way to look at it, it is nevertheless the case that it's probably more often right than not, just like it's more often right that that guy took the watch than it wasn't. There's something that got through the purse that made him pick that person. It's also possible that it could have been just random luck. That's always a possibility. And there's nothing about judgmental rotation that guarantees that it's better than something else. But it's, it's able to, then to take advantage of an aspect of the scientific situation that is unavailable to verify, namely the guesses, the hunches, uh, the knowledge that the observer brings to it. So I suspect that there probably never is a situation actually in which the, the person is just completely void of any kind of sense. And I think for Stevenson, that was a good enough basis, no matter how slim it seemed to be for you know, rotating through respondent number 23, although you might not even have been able to say why you thought that was a good move to make. There was something about the interview. I don't know, you know, uh, uh, you know when I had the interview with a person, he said some things that other people didn't say, and, and that was interesting. I, I don't know why it was interesting, but, you know, so he has this kind of vague kind of feeling, and he follows up that hunch, and then the question is, you know, what comes of it? Now again, those are very difficult things to get across. It, it makes much more sense, I think, or it's easier to defend when you're do, uh, doing an intensive case. Because then, presumably, you know a lot about this person. You know, and, and you have some kind of theory, a psychological theory, or other kind of theory that's guiding you. So you have some sort of ideas about projection or denial if you're a psychoanalytic factor analyst, and there are precious few of those. Uh, uh, then you have some kind of knowledge that you might not have if you have 40 Q sorts from each of 40 people with no particular deep knowledge about any one of them. Um, so again, there's nothing wrong with doing Veramax and SPSS, and, and oftentimes I will do, uh, I'll take a four-factor solution, a five-factor solution, a six-factor solution from SPSS and look at those, and I'll take a, a judgmental rotation, and I'll use a rotated and unrotated, so I may have several solutions, and look over them and see if any one of them suggests itself as being a better <coughs> way to represent this. And, and when you get done, th this may seem very arbitrary a priori, but when you get done doing that and making a judgment, you would be able to tell any competent person why it was you made that selection. I mean, it would not have been for frivolous reasons. You would have made them for particular specifiable reasons so that it was not an arbitrary judgment. I mean, the judgment may have been judge a judgment and subjective in that kind of sense, but it was not without reason. And you would be able to say, well, the reason I didn't take the five-factor solution is then three-quarters of the people had mixed loadings. And anybody who knew about factor analysis would look down and say, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, well, obviously the five-factors, uh, well, how come you didn't take the four-factor solution? Well, in that case, it left out these three people who were very important because of their position in the organization. And said, oh, I didn't know that. Well, yeah, you're probably right. They should, you know, be, I mean, there would be reasons that you'd be able to give as to why this factor solution rather than that one, and they would not be statistical reasons, although some of them might be. I mean, some uh, factor structures that you get out may just look so messy as to be an unpalatable way of thinking about the problem. You've got four factors and everybody has a mixed loading. There's nobody that's pure or something like that. And so you may, on statistical grounds, say that you know, this is not going to be a, a good way to look at this. We need something that's a little cleaner, uh, so let's rotate in some other kind of way. Uh, yes? I think that's the beginner's question of the work done, which is, I appreciate when you're doing fact rotation that you're not moving, you're not changing the variance as a whole in the graph. You're not moving anybody's sort yeah. around or anything like that. But I, I, I come at it with this, I know there's a misconception in here somewhere, which is when I look at the initial unrotated uh, factor locus, and I see that somebody looks to be not Surely loaded on either A or B, mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. There's a team that seems to me to represent something about their sort. Mm -hmm. And then we go in and rotate the factors, and all of a sudden now this person is purely loaded mm -hmm. much higher on one factor and less on others. There's, there's something about that that I don't get because it seems like 
going in and kind of mucking with the data and making them say something they originally weren't. Uh, I, I think I lost some, uh, something, and I think you're onto something <laughs> important. Could you rephrase it? Or maybe just say Which it again? <laughs> you, you have something initially before the, the factor analysis. What is it about the Q sort that, that you were saying? That oh, there's just, when I look at the initial, the graph of the, un, mm -hmm. or the initial <coughs> unrotated factors. Unrotated. Mm -hmm. Unrotated. Um, and you see that, you know, uh, say one person is, in terms of their factor space, not uh, purely loaded on mm -hmm. any one factor, mm -hmm. but somewhere in mm -hmm. between. A and B, something like that. Now, to me, then that then that seems to imply some. Well, that that seems to me to be almost a statement of fact you know, that they you couldn't look at their sort and and find any one of the factors <coughs> by it clearly because they're okay. So then, when you go to rotate the factors, and all of a sudden this person is now purely loaded on A, and their view in this sense is a, a pure representation of, say, factor A, when prior to the rotation, it wasn't. There is oh, I something see. in there I'm not appreciating. Yeah, I see, I see. Um, well, the, the fact that the person is uncorrelated with everybody else, you may get factors A, B, and C, and that person has zero loading on all of those. That means that that person is out on some other dimension. We could call it D, E, F, but we could also call that A and call these others B, C, and D, so that the labels don't matter. All the factors indicate is if that person is alone in factor space, uh, we can include that person still as a factor. Uh, there may be other people who uh, believe as that person does, and we just don't happen to have them in our study. If we did, there would, that person would have a soulmate that would be on the same factor. Uh, or it could be that that person <coughs> is idiosyncratic, uh, just totally different from everybody. Uh, if we gave a Q sort about the nature of the universe to physicists uh, in the year two, uh, year 1905, Einstein would have been on factor D all by himself, you know, because he would have seen things differently than everybody else was seeing. Uh, and eventually, we'd see people starting to drift over <laughs> and uh, abandon some other factors. Uh, so. Uh, and again, whether you're going to emphasize that person or not depends on the purpose of the study. How important is that person? Uh, if it's an Einstein, you may want to include even though there's only one person on it, simply because of who that person is. Or if the investigator has put his or her own QSOR in there and wants to be able to show, here am I, and here is everybody else on these other factors, that might then provide you with some evidence to say, to, to, to indicate that you're looking at these other factors in a detached way, in the sense that I am not among them, I am not one of them, and therefore my, my interpretation of these factors comes from outside, detached in that sense. Uh, whereas it's always kind of suspect if you're describing the difference between factor A and factor B and you're on factor A as to how objective you're being about <coughs> that, particularly if you're talking about something like abortion versus, you know, abortion attitudes and that kind of, kind of thing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but should you have a piece of software that was sophisticated enough to do a three-dimensional model of the data? I think I think the question that he's raising is that when you rotate, you're concentrating on one more than the other, and you lose sight of the others. But if you had a three-dimensional model that you could see, you'd be able to see where everybody is related to the other groups. So long as it wasn't a fourth thing. Uh, fourth dimension, is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, sure, I mean, that helps. And that's the reason I think there's some interest in uh, Paul Summit's uh, software package, because his is a three-dimensional, I mean, it simulates a three-dimensional space. Um, I don't know that that's a big drawback. All we're doing here is we're looking at the factors two at a time. You know? But clearly, when we're looking at these factors, we're aware that this person is over here on factor three. But when we're plotting factors one and two, that person's going to be down <coughs> on zero for both one and two because he's out on three. It's just the confusion of the three-dimensional space because you're now looking from a different perspective. That's right. right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. But it doesn't change the, the, no, no, no. the data itself, and the, and the ultimate result that you get is still going to be important. The That's right. You're placing important on one factor more than the other. That's right. Yeah. And something that Brian mentioned before, and most of you probably know it, but so I'll just say it very quickly: the rotation doesn't change anything from a statistical standpoint, that is, 
the, if we took the original unrotated factors and squared each one of these factors of point whatever it was squared plus point whatever it was and added up all of the factor loadings squared and now put these rotated loadings and took point 19 squared plus 0 0.05 squared plus 0 0.57, those numbers would be identical. So all it is is you're just sort of reshuffling the uh, common variability by looking at the factors of a different kind of angle and so that moves the, the variance around. But it, so one of the answers to critics who say, well, if you do a theoretical rotation, you can prove anything that you want. For one thing, that's not true. Most of the critics who said that never did a theoretical rotation in their life. They just thought it was true <laughs> and that you just had all kinds of liberty, which you don't. But when you get done, the Veramax solution is going to do the same thing as the judgmental rotation is going to do. The factor loading still translate back exactly into the original correlation. So, so why do you do the rotation at all? Well, you do the rotation because you're trying to look at the data in a particular way. So that you can see who's where. Well, that you, you know, that you think that this particular group of people is important for some kind of theoretical way and you want them all on one factor. So you rotate it. And whether you look at it that way or according to some other kind of theory, all of them get translated back into the original correlation matrix in the same way. With, there's, of course, limitations on that statement. It depends on which factors you keep and all of that kind of thing. But in principle, they all explain the same reality, which is the correlation matrix. Uh, and so uh, you're not really doing anything funny with the data. It's the variance remains the same. I do have a question, but my colleague over here has been waiting long. Oh, I'm sorry. Like uh, just kind of one comment or perhaps a question. You've got factor A and you rotate it. Would it be correct to say that those are no longer the same factors? You, in effect, got a new factor A yes. that yes. you're looking at. Yes. So that's okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's just like if you're, I mean, the, the example I somebody do to my classes may go without saying. I, uh, but, um, you know, I, I say, look, if you're standing on in front of a billboard, let's say, uh, if you're standing on front of a bill in front of a billboard, it might look like that, you know, with letters up and so on and so forth. So you're standing here on that billboard. Now, if you walk around to the side over here and look at the billboard, what you're going to see is something that looks like that. Now, it's not a question of uh, is there a right place to be with regard? It's for what reason are you standing here rather than some other kind of place? If you're standing over here, it no longer the lines are no longer parallel, you know, but they're slanted because of where you're standing. So that your your angle of vision on the reality, the billboard being the reality at this point, is going to depend on where you. And I think Stevenson knew that because as a physicist, uh, he had known all of this stuff about relativity. I mean, that was. Uh, in the air. He got his physics degree in uh, 1927, PhD in physics, and, and uh, you know, Einstein's general theory was in 1915. Uh, those were being discussed at that time. He also knew a lot about quantum theory. I mean, it was roughly in the 20s, around 1925, certainly by 1930, that all of the main ideas were being uh, fought out. That's when he got his dissertation. Those things were, and, and a lot of British physicists were involved in that. So the idea of indeterminacy and, and um, of the kind that you get, the, 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 we don't know a priori how many factors. It's indeterminate how many factors we're going to get. <coughs> and, uh, everything is indeterminate. Therefore, you don't want to use determinate procedures like Veramax that apply the same geometric model uh, irrespective of time, place, or anything else to every single problem as if every problem is going to conform to that particular model. Rather, you need intellectual flexibility to deal with a particular <coughs> different situation. So all of that, I think, was just in his blood as a physicist, and he brought that to, to then psychophysics. So it's, uh, uh, my particular interest is HRD and organizational development of OD. The item that you just mentioned of rotating so that the most important person in the organization, mm -hmm. perhaps the president, would have the maximum loading mm -hmm. on a factor, mm -hmm. then that would give you a good indication of how these other people were relating or at least seeing reality in the yes. same way that the uh, uh, most important person was seeing. Yes, and you as the factor analyst and as the observer uh, may know far better than the computer 
does, whether there is a Rasputin in the organization who really has the power. <laughs> and therefore, if you're going to rotate, you may ignore the CEO and rotate through the CEO's wife. <laughs> Let's say, <laughs> or you know, or the, or the second in command, or the secretary, that, whoever. That would be a reasonable yeah. interpretation of what your uh, voting factors. Mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And again, there's nothing objective about standing over here relative to the to the uh, billboard, or standing someplace else. Is where is the most beneficial place to be to see the action in a particular kind of way? And uh, so I think. Yeah, and you see, this doesn't have anything to do with statistics. That's why people would say, why are you holding on to centroid factor analysis? It's, a, it's only a statistical approximation to principal axis and principal components. You know, it wouldn't amount to a hill of beans as far as Stevens was concerned. It was the indeterminacy of the centroid that enabled him to look at the billboard from a different angle without violating any rules. There's no statistical rules that have been violated because the centroid loadings are indeterminate to start off with. So you can rotate, you can replace them with any other set of loadings that are just as valid. So it, it was it was using the the mechanics of factor analysis to probe psychological space or, or organizational <coughs> climate space or at it or whatever, uh, and, to, and to take a particular position relative to the, to the field of, of interest. Excuse me, Mike. Steve, using your... Uh, get right back. I'm sorry. Please. Actually, John, you had asked before. I'm sorry. The uh, program obviously tells us that you know, these factors come in a particular order. Does it, like SVSS, tell us the relative amount of variance mm -hmm. uh, for wage? And if so, can this program, in a sense, collapse that graph? And the way the graph was created, uh, let's say I was mapping factor one against factor six, it, in a sense, gives you equal space to be mm -hmm. so that if people were 0.4 units away or factor 1 and 0.4 away from factor 6, they'd be counted as equal distant. But if we find that factor 6 is 0.4 and 5% variance and factor 1 is accounted for 40%, surely it should compress one of the axes. Does it do that for No, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, it could have, but that's one of these uh, philosophical principles that's built uh, into uh, this one. I, I think uh, from Stevenson's standpoint, that doesn't matter at all, uh, in, in the sense that uh, the respondents that we get in here, we could have replaced with other respondents. Uh, and so these particular respondents don't uh, matter as, as such. Uh, this person could have been taken out, person number four, say, uh, and, the existent, and the existence of factor two could be demonstrated anyway because there's somebody who thinks that way even without this person. So we're not so much concerned how many people think this way. Uh, and the reason we're not concerned is we don't want to get into that game of making those kinds of statements, because then we'll really get, you know, the, uh, the editors, the journals will really come at us about sample size and all of that kind of thing. As long as you're restricting yourself to talking about the different ways of thought, as opposed to associating these things too strongly with presumed demographics, you know, there are more women on this factor than men, and, or there are more blacks than whites, or Democrats than Republicans, or, or whatever. Uh, then they can always come back and say, well, why don't you get a, you know, a random sample? Uh, you've got such a small... <coughs> Only if you did have a random sample of a suitable size could you associate anything with the amount of variance accounted for. Because without that, the variance accounted for may be all cattywampus. But it doesn't matter so long as you're talking about how does this way of thinking about the problem differ from this way of thinking. Just like we would talk about the difference between positivists and postmodernists. I have no idea how many there are, or if we got them, how much of the variability in, in social philosophical space would be accounted for by one or the other. But I can, after very quickly talking to somebody, tell you whether this person's a positivist or a, or a postmodernist because of the way they talk and the quality of thought that distinguishes one from the other. Um, so in a sense, that doesn't matter how much of the variability, which will change uh, depending on how many people. We just happen to get maybe more people into the factor A type, and therefore the eigenvalue for this factor is going to be big compared to the others. But it was an accident. It's not a random sample anyway. 
so that just like these people were included accidentally, the size of their eigenvalue is also an accident. It would be only if you were dealing with the entire population, like if you got all nine members of the Supreme Court to tell you how they judge this case and you gave them the Q sort, then you could say that, you know, 50 some percent of the variance in the decision was due to this factor, or, or if you're dealing with a random sample. It's the same thing with our methodology. See, the R methodologists don't realize that when they report these eigenvalues and percent variance accounted for, they are assuming that they have a random sample of variables. You see, these, these all have the status of variables, these people here in Q methodology. And so when you get a factor and you, you know, you've studied, you've put in uh, IQ and you've put in mathematical ability and you've put in uh, authoritarianism and neuroticism, and you get all of these variables that you think are important and you get a particular kind of factor structure, now the variables are traits. But what if you hadn't included that particular trait? Well, it was just an accident. I mean, an accident in the sense that you made some sort of subjective judgment to include that in your study. Had you not included that variable, if number two was a, an R variable, and you've taken that out, that means that that would come out, and this factor would count for less variance than it did before. So that variance is no more an objective feature of this matrix than the decision to include that variable. And these, including all those variables, is just the judgment of the investigator. And so most of them, when they're criticizing us for lack of random samples and all of this kind of thing, don't realize that the same argument applies to them in reverse. You know, and it's a criticism. But if we don't make any claims about those, we're on safe ground, they're still on quicksand, even though they may not tell us. If you have a random, sam a random sample for your study, mm. if it is truly random, mm. then it would reflect the prevalence of those factors. That's right, that's right. Too. That's right. That's if right. you ask the question. Yes. That's right. But then, again, it's a question of where are you going to stop explaining? Because you say this person, take a random sample, and this person is, uh, you know, uh, a member of the random of the sample, and that person ends up being on a factor. But in the depth interview, you get the impression that that person is uh, trying to uh, want you to think of him or her as brave or <coughs> intelligent or whatever it is that you're studying. And so they're trying to look liberal because you're doing a, a study, but actually the person is not. So that. Uh, just, you know, it depends on at what level your explanation is going to stop, whether you're going to stay at the surface level or whether you're going to dig down deeper and that kind of thing. If one wants a random sample, if one wants generalizability in that sense, and wants to account for an amount of, of uh, variance and so on and so forth, one ought to be doing our methodology uh, as opposed to using Q methodology uh, as a way to do our methodological studies. Uh, it's, it's not designed to make the it can be used for that. I mean, it is a tool, after all, it can be used. Books are to be read, but you can also use them as doorstops. I mean, there's no limit on, on what it is that you would do with a tool simply because it exists. Uh, and so I'm not about to say that it's wrong in some kind of absolute sense. But by the same token, uh, you know, Stevenson was interested in the single case and, and uh, intensive studies and, and getting respondents who are you know, subjects who uh, are of theoretical importance. and. Uh, so the kinds of questions he was asking, I think, were in many ways different from the kinds of questions other people ask who also want to use Q-sorts, and they may not be a good fit. Uh, so, yes? Is there a way to combine the power, the unique power of Q methodology with what seems to be the domain of our types of research so that you get the best of both without paying an ordinary high price? For example, if Q method gives you a better way of getting a self-referential point of view, a person compares one statement with your 19 others or however many of the sort, then you're getting really a, a higher quality piece of information from the person about that particular subject. But it's limited in terms of attitudes, values, outlooks. It is not about facts. But at some point, some researchers want to shift over from that internal point of reference and deal with facts yeah. because it may be of greater interest sure. to the sponsor. Sure. No, no, uh, is there a strategy for combining the two? That sort of there is, the uh, and it's uh, at least one strategy is uh, in Stevenson's book, the chapter on the prior analysis of questionnaires. If you're going to ask questions to a large sample of people because you're wanting to know, you're wanting to take into account the factors that you've now demonstrated exist from a cumulative study. 
and you somehow want to build in the fact that we've got factors A, B, and C, but you're now also going to want to ask people their age, their IQ, how tall they are, what the grade point average is, or any number of other things that, that seem to be pertinent for some reason or another, right. pertinent to those factors, and some strategy or policy stance you may take relative to those factors. It could be about anything, advertising, or we find out there's three different ways of thinking about chocolate candy, for example, and Hershey is higher gene. Now they want to know a lot of other things. What are the demographics? Do women like chocolate? Are they more apt to be factor A types than, or, or men? Uh, uh, people with a lot of money to spend uh, versus those that don't. Uh, you know, all kinds of other kinds of demographic things. Then one could take the statements, and that provides a good segue into the next phase of this by getting the factor scores to see which statements would be the best ones put in a questionnaire if you wanted to start counting noses to seeing then how many factor A types there are and factor B types in the fashion of questionnaire now that you could simply do over the telephone. Uh, you could ask them question number one, question number two, question number three, and their responses position them as a factor A type, a B type, and C type. But you didn't know a priori which statement to ask, how many factors there were, or anything like that. Now you know. Right. So you ask those kinds of things, and when you're done with that, you also say, incidentally, how old are you? Are you male or female? Do you like, do you like candy or do you not? You know, right. It sounds like a very good way to combine. The, uh, <laughs> there are, I think, uh, probably a dozen uh, studies of which I'm aware in the history of Q that um, uh, have done that. Uh, and uh, most of them in politics, a couple of others in psychology. Uh, and I keep a little list of those because that question arises from time to time. So, uh, you know, on email or I could post them on Q method. Uh, again, they probably haven't been posted for a couple of years. And there have been a couple of others that have been added since then. Uh, but the literature is very small. Very small. Those would give examples of how to different strategies for combining them. Um, I don't know that the strategies are very different from what Stevenson did in the prior analysis of questionnaires. Uh, some, of, some people have come to that independently in that they've been unaware of what Stevenson did, right. but in a s essence did the same thing and thought they were being innovative. Uh, but, uh, so that's the first mention, I think, of Stevenson's. That's in his 50, yeah. book? Yes. Yeah. Is it fair to extend your analogy this afternoon about the uh, billboard? The real purpose of the study is to figure out what the message is on the billboard. Factor rotation is equivalent to walking around the billboard and positioning the tripod and the camera. Mm -hmm. If the purpose is to read the message, there are certain places where you place the tripod where you would get a much clearer, that is to say, a less distorted view of the, of the message mm -hmm. on the billboard. Mm -hmm. You decide uh, where you're going to place the camera on the tripod, and that's the equivalent to setting settling upon a rotated solution. The act of taking the photograph and then developing it is really what reveals the message to you. And that is not contained in here, but rather in the factor array that comes out of these rotated solutions. What triggers my thought about that is a Brian Midgley sounded like slightly guilty comment that by rotating of uh, axes, you can have it look as though one respondent is sometimes on one factor, sometimes on another factor, when in fact what you're doing is not changing the viewpoint of that respondent at all. You're just moving the position of the camera. Mm -hmm. Some respondents have a better view of the message on the billboard than others. Mm -hmm. And if you want to learn about the message on the billboard, you look at those respondents who face that message most clearly. They load most strongly on those factors. I could stand right now in such a way that um, Topeka looks to be on a straight line between Columbia and, and, and uh, Kansas City and so forth. Uh, but if I were to go down to Springfield, Kansas City would be up here and Topeka would be over here. Now that doesn't mean Topeka changed or, or, or Kansas City changed or anything. You changed the position from which you're looking at these two different uh, geographic points. And similarly with the with the uh, billboard, um, you know, you look at a different angle, and you haven't changed reality in that kind of sense. I haven't changed where Topeka is, I haven't changed where Kansas City is, but I've changed the angle. And there may be some angles of looking at something, like whether you look at look. I mean, when, when you take a kind of Marxian view about American society, you get a different kind of uh, conception of society than if you take uh, an elitist view. 
here. This is in political science. You can't ignore the example. But, or if you take a, a Freudian view as opposed to an interbehavioral view, there's certain features of reality so on, that uh, come into prominence uh, when you do it. And I think that's all Stevenson was doing with the judgmental rotation. There's certain things that come into prominence uh, that you don't see, and sometimes you don't know what those are going to be ahead of time. You just get certain inklings that if I look at it this way, there's something interesting is going to happen. And you get it. If it's not, uh, chuck it. Start over. It doesn't cost you anything, but a little bit of time to rotate again. And, and, and things like Q method and PCQ cut down the time considerably so that you can go back. Uh, if we had something in Operant Subjectivity some years ago about the theoretical physicist consisted mainly of drinking coffee and scribbling on paper that you sit down and you get an idea and you start chasing down mathematically the consequences of that. And if it turns out that one of the consequences is that the moon is made of green cheese, you say, whoops, uh, obviously that idea is wrong. You crumple the paper, throw it away, and go back to another cup of coffee. Uh, and that you get this kind of, uh, well, fact of rotation is the same kind of way. You get this idea and you rotate and so forth. Yeah, not such a hot idea after all. You know, so you go back and look at it in some other kind of way. So, so by rotating, you don't change the, the relationships of the respondents to reality. That's right. But what Some we of the do squares. change are the factor scores. That's right. And the interpretations, as evidenced right. by these synthetic Q, Q sorts, That's right. does change. That's right. So that you can get uh, schizoid meanings mm -hmm. by the changes in the factor scores, and yet you have changed none of the data nor the relationships mm -hmm. of any of the respondents that's right. to that data. That's right. And that's one of the reasons Stevenson make that sharp distinction between uh, uh, understanding and explanation or ours intelligentsia and ours expecondi or something uh, like that. It, that, you know, that your explanation of things, it may be Marxist or psychoanalytic or underbehavioral or any other kind of thing, is separate from, from the, the reality being explained, being uh, uh, understood. <coughs> and I think. That's what has been disappointing to some people with psychoanalytic interests, for example, who've gotten interested in Q, and conceive of the factors as being uh, mental structures of some kind and want to think of them in that way, and then find other people who disdain uh, uh, psychoanalytic kinds of ideas and eventually, and see that Q isn't standing up for psychoanalysis, it's not opposed to it either, uh, and get disappointed and wander off. And I think uh, that sometimes some of the postmodernists or the social constructivists who want to see factors by definition as being social constructions, well, that's an interesting interpretation of factors, but it is an interpretation of the factors. It's not something that's intrinsic to the factors. You know, and so, so long as you can keep that separate, you know, you can walk around the billboard any way you want. When you look at it a particular way, you can give an interpretation to that. Uh, but I think you start getting on, you know, kind of uneven ground when you start thinking that uh, somehow that inheres in, in the reality as opposed to the relationship of the observer to it. What's your consequence? Uh, the factor, the factors exist in two reality, two independent of the I don't know that you could say that. I mean, that would probably be an unanswerable kind of question. Uh, what is it? Uh, I think, I think people who use Veramax all the time think that there are fact, factorial structures out there independent of themselves. And they, they would want, therefore, the results that they get to be independent of their will. And they think they're doing that by leaving it to the computer. And in a certain sense, they're right, because they haven't touched the fact. They often use the formulation, the existing factor. The factor exists independent of what's happened. So my question is, do you have a realistic philosophy uh, that uh, you try to <coughs> reconstruct something that is Well, that's a, that's a $64,000 question. I mean, that's an Einstein and Bohr argued about that. <laughs> exactly. You know, does, is the cat, you know, alive and independent, Schrodinger's cat, independently of whether we measure whether it's alive or, or whether we open it up? And Einstein said, said yes, because he was a reader. The question to you is, uh, it doesn't matter uh, to answer the question yes or no. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I'm interested in what you can say is uh, there might be this interpretation or this rotation or that rotation. Uh, they are all consistent with the data I have. <coughs> uh, but uh, 
put it to different positions. The one would say they are uh, real factors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't know that that's... There might be the critique concerning uh, some other person. Uh, no, you're not just, uh, you're wrong. Uh, everything you are uh, speaking about is in the eye of you as mm. the older. They don't exist. Anymore. I don't think that that can be resolved within Q methodology. But by the same token, the claims that people make about that can be the subject of a Q study. I mean, it's not a matter we, we, we can decide, because those are sub subjective, you know, whether the world is determinate or not, whether the factors really exist. Uh, I could collect statements about that and show that there are realists over here on one factor that think factors really exist and, and that they have causal potency and all that kind of, and there are other people here that think they're socially constructed and show that those factors exist, but as far as coming, and I may have a personal judgment that I'm, and I may be able to demonstrate that I'm on factor A or that I'm on factor B myself. You, you never, but it doesn't solve the problem. You never you're say right. anything that puts you in the position that somebody can come and say, you're wrong. I have the data, or I have your data that shows you're wrong. Is it, am I right? So. Well, if somebody comes along with that uh, evidence, I'd be more than I'd be most, most interested in seeing. <laughs> I don't think it's probably possible to get. You know, uh, the position you're defending is in a way that uh, it cannot be uh, made obsolete on the basis of an empirical test. Yeah, I would agree. Steve? But others may disagree. I mean, Cattell, I mean, you get the same thing in our methodology. Cattell thought factors were causal dimensions, you know, and other our factor analysts thought not. I think Bohr would say that that your your empirical test is, by its very nature, going to make that an inter interdependent relationship. That there is no independent reality. As soon as you make the observation, you negate it. It's independent. But Einstein would disagree. Correct. Yeah. So. So. I was just thinking about that. It's, yeah, it's not a Q problem. I mean, you should be thinking of, of, about the billboard. About the, what? I, about the billboard. I stand in front yeah. of the billboard. You stand in front of mm -hmm. the billboard. Uh, I can never be sure that you see exactly the same thing I see. I mean, how, how could I? And and you might even be colorblind. And and I see colors. I mean, we can't even be sure of that. Mm -hmm. So how can we be sure of what another person sees in that data? Mm -hmm. And that, that, that brings up a, a related point, too, because it's not impossible for people to end up on the same factor for totally different reasons. I mean, just because you've got people on the factor does not mean necessarily that they have the same <coughs> attitude. They are, that there may be different reasons. Stevenson mentioned that with regard to uh, the selective service problem, I think, in uh, the, the Korean War in the, the United States, that there were some people who were actually aggressive, ready to go to war and fight and so on, and there, there were others who were actually fearful uh, and who were defending against that by appearing to be brave, but it was like whistling in the dark <coughs> as opposed to being as, as opposed to being self-confident and actually brave, courageous in the dark and whistling in the dark. There may be two different ways to be in the dark, but you're both on the same factor and, and you, you know, it looks like a duck, it sounds like a duck, but it ain't a duck, you know, it's something else. <laughs> Could I ask a follow-up question on the, the billboard, or whether it's the billboard or the elephant, you know, that we're all looking at? Uh, pedagogically, how do you, how would you explain the perspective of the unrotated matrix? Where, where are you standing? Uh, sometimes the unrotated matrix uh, is the best one. I mean, uh, uh, again, it depends on how the data come out as to whether you're going to rotate at all. We haven't really rotated that much. Yeah, but, I mean, if so you want to take a picture, yeah, you might, yeah. at the first time, you might just stand in the right spot, but you still try out a little, hmm. I mean, try it from yeah. here, try it from there, the and you might end up on the same spot, so I don't But think that can be the, the best position to look right. at. But, but yeah. ways, where is it? I mean, is it a, a, a common starting point, or is it just somewhere at random? Oh, where is it? You're under oh, uh, Are you, you right in front of it, or are you over to the side oh, of it? Oh, oh, well. Uh, I don't know that you'd, Does it matter? you'd uh, determine that, but, but uh, you know, when you get situations in which uh, uh, there's a whole lot of unanimity, obviously that's when you're going to get a general factor. And we did a, 
uh, like studies of organizational climate, that is not uncommon. Uh, there's a, a person down at the uh, University of Houston who did her first year study and, and quit. I think she was disappointed at the results she was doing a study of organizational climate got one factor. And I said, terrific. <laughs> That's the way a lot of people think it's supposed to look. There's a common, and she never thought about that. She thought it was a bad Q sample and, and therefore, uh, you know, didn't really show what was really going on. It was probably showing what was going on quite well. Uh, that's not to say that, that organizational cultures can't be fractioned in some kind of way, that you could have two factors or three factors or bipolar factors or anything else, but, but certainly having one factor would not necessarily be an in inaccurate uh, assessment of what's going on in an organization. Uh, some years ago we uh, asked people to generate a lot of names of famous people, um, living, dead, mythical, real, historical, current, and then had them rank them from those that they felt most drawn to or liked the best or something like that, down to those that they despised, and got one huge factor. And it was, uh, you know, at the top end were Christ and Gandhi and Martin Luther King and, yeah. and uh, so forth. At the opposite end were Charles Manson and Adolf Hitler and uh, Richard Nixon, interestingly. <laughs> <laughs> Others. So now there was there was some evidence of another factor, but it was so, and it was a left versus right. Uh, the second factor, we had uh, General Patton and then Bob Hope, really uh, and uh, uh, General De Gaulle, I think, and on the other end was uh, Jane Fonda, who at that time was a leftist, and, and uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh, and this was done back in the 60s or 70s. But it was weak compared to the first, and had we tried to rotate it, everybody would have been mixed. And it was better to say, okay, this is a cultural consensus. These are the, uh, the uh, society-wide icons, the Martin Luther Kings and the Gandhi. Everybody, it doesn't matter if you're left, right, or whatever, everybody gives those plus fives and so forth. It's only when you get down around plus two, and plus three, or something like that, that people start <coughs> going in a different direction. And so there was a lot of... So then it made sense just to stay where you were with the unrotated, because it was... Uh, that way you got this sort of cultural conception out of the way. And whatever other factors exist then must be independent of this cultural consensus. So you could look at them independently of, of that. Uh, not very often now, you see BERT, I think, and when you get those, when you plot them, like on uh, Q-Method, what you get is uh, a bunch of people that are all up here at one end of the factor. Mm -hmm. And the extent to which there's any secondary factor is the extent to which you get spread in this direction. So if, if they're like this, then there may also be a factor B that some people are positive thinking about. Everybody is high on factor A. Uh, Bert, I think, uh, one of his uh, positions was to keep the unrotated factor. Uh, but uh, again, that's one of those kind of general rules that's just begging to be broken. <laughs> you don't always use very much. You don't always use judgmental, maybe uh, unrotated factors. It depends very much on the character of the study.